All right, we move on to 2 Thessalonians. I wanted to, oh, I need my little guy. I wanted to just briefly remind you, you probably don't need this, but you'll recall that Paul, Silas, and Timothy on their second missionary journey, remember they were steered to Troas by the Spirit, and then they sailed from there to Macedonia in response to the vision that Paul received. And in Philippi, Paul and Silas, they were flogged illegally. Now, I just think about being flogged. Uh, That's not my idea of a fun time. But they were flogged illegally, and they were thrown into prison. And they then went from there to Thessalonica, and that's where they planted the church to which the Thessalonian letters are written. Now, after planting the Thessalonian church, they were forced to flee to Berea, having spent at most a few months, it's not clear how long they were there, but at most a few months in Thessalonica. And Paul's experience in Berea was similar to his experience in Thessalonica. So the brothers then, they they sent him off to Athens, and he was later joined there in Athens by Silas and Timothy. And then Timothy was sent back to Thessalonica from Paul's there in Athens. You see that in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. And then he rejoins Paul, who had since moved from Athens to Corinth. And then Timothy arrives there, and based on Timothy's news, what he tells him about what he had learned from his visit to the church in Thessalonica, that then prompts Paul to write 1 Thessalonians, which is the letter that we just finished looking at. Now, 2 Thessalonians probably is written several months after that. How many? Can't tell. You know, you're playing this by ear kind of thing. He deals with some of the same situations, some of the same issues. So it's probably written some months after after that, and it's a follow-up pastoral letter. And it looks that like Paul's rebuttal in 1 Thessalonians of the attacks on Paul and his companions that had been launched, it looks like that, that was success. Remember that you, you apparently had people in Thessalonica saying, well, they were just in it for themselves. You know, they're just trying, you know, they're trying to hoodwink you and that kind of thing. And Paul addresses that in 1 Thessalonians. Well, that seems to have calmed that down. But some of the other problems needed further attention, and particularly this problem of idleness persists, where you have people who are not working and who think that they're entitled to be given things from the church. Now, what all was behind that, you don't know, whether it was some theological idea that I think now we're at the end, so who needs to work? But whatever it was, you had people who weren't working and they were taking from the church. Paul had addressed that, but apparently that didn't take, or this was, they were very resistant to this, so he's going to really address it uh, in 2 Thessalonians. And there were also further misunderstandings about Christ's second coming. Now this was something that was generated by uh, a report or something that supposedly from Paul and them, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. But here in, in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is very similar to the greeting that he gave in 1 Thessalonians 1.1. The differences are that Paul here he refers to the church of the Thessalonians, the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father. Whereas in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, he said, in God, Father, meaning in God, the Father. So he has that change, and here he follows grace and peace to you with the phrase, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, when he says God our Father, you have this idea that God is the Father of Christians in a distinct way. You know, there's a sense you can say, well, is he, is he the Father? Yeah, you, you could say that, but there's something about the relationship with Christians That he's our father in a distinct way. And the blessings of grace and peace, they are from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In that they are the source of those blessings. They provide this grace by which we are forgiven and all of these blessings that we receive. And the peace, the reconciliation and the harmony that we enjoy because of that. They are the source of those. And this, that phrase, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that is Paul's typical greeting. That's the typical one. Not, in, not the one you get in 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, 
where he omits that. You see that Greek, the one here that he has in 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, you see that in Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, that he has that. So this is not the least bit unusual or, or odd. Now then in verses 3 to 12, you have thanksgiving, encouragement, and prayer. And so it's really a block, but instead of reading the whole thing, I'm going to try to do it in little sections, and then I'll talk about each of the sections. In verses 3 and 4, he says, we ought always, we ought, we're obligated to, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of each one of you all for one another is increasing so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God because of your perseverance and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions which you are enduring. So Paul says, look, Paul and his companions, the missionaries, they are bound to thank God regularly for the Thessalonians because their faith is flourishing and their love for one another is increasing. And this is evidence of God's work among them. This is evidence of God's work among them. See, his granting the prayer that they, that they revealed in 1 Thessalonians 3.12. That their love, that their faith is flourishing, their love is, is, incre is increasing. To fail to thank him, to thank God in light of that, this work that he is doing among the Thessalonians, to fail to thank him for that would be to deny him his due honor and his due gratitude. So he says that we ought. You see, because of what God is doing here. And notice the breadth of this increasing love. The love that each one of you all has for one another. It's increasing. And it's really something that's, in, that's captured the whole church. They were all part of this work of God. In this congregation that you have in Thessalonica, love was a bond uniting the entire church. And I don't think you can say anything greater about a church than that they have this bond where they really do feel a connection and an obligation to one another that we are family. That because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that that's not simply a word, that that carries something with it. That that means I owe you, you see, as a brother or sister. As I've often said, you know, when, when something happens, your car breaks down somewhere, who you call and you're calling your brother. You're calling him at three in the morning and you're saying, I need you to come get me. And you said, you know, what's your brother going to say? Your brother's going to say, well, you say, you know, you're my brother. So it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to come. So, so you see, there's something about this love that has this idea of, of being committed to one another. And that's what he's seeing here in the church. And Paul is, is very thankful for that. Now, given the emphasis there in 1 Thessalonians, that emphasis that love be evident among them, this was no doubt a joyful thing for the Thessalonians to hear from Paul. Right? I mean, here comes Paul. He plants the church. They're enduring in the face of persecution. Timothy comes to visit. Paul writes them, and he wants them to really flourish in this faith and the love that comes from that. And then Paul writes him back, and he says, ah. He says, man, I really love it. I'm hearing that you're just loving. Your love is just deep and wide, and God is at work among you. Well, you know that has to be a blessing for the church to hear that, for the Thessalonians to hear that. I'm struggling with this earpiece here, but hey. So that, that's something I think that's important. Now, of course, Paul's not suggesting, I make this point all the time, he's not suggesting that they had arrived in the sense that they didn't need to grow any further in their faith and love. That will not be true until Jesus returns. That's when our progression toward Christ, our growth in Christ-likeness, will be finalized. Our sanctification will be finalized. So until then, we are always on a pursuit of better, higher, nobler, purer, more like Jesus. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are exemplary and noteworthy that you can't say, well, I can't tell somebody, you know, you're really doing great in that because, well, you're a long way from Jesus. Well, I know that. <laughs> yeah. 
But Paul is willing to say, look, you're really doing great in these things. Their love is evident among them. And so that's an important thing. That, that you know, that even though that they, they haven't arrived. And this praise of them, you see this praise, I'm really implicit in that. It's really a way of saying, look, keep going. You see, keep it up. You're on the right track. I'm loving it. Keep at it. You see, so implicit in that is this idea of continue pursuing in this direction. Now, the missionaries are even boasting about them to other churches because of this, uh, their flourishing faith and the increase, because their flourishing faith and the increasing love that accompanies a flourishing faith, they're happening as they persevere in the face of persecution and affliction. They're bragging about other churches because their faith is flourishing. The love that is connected to flourishing faith is really increasing because it's happening in the face of persecution. You see, it's a thing where look at their faith that it's costing them something. And yet look at it just blossoming. It's growing despite that. And you see the reference here to all, where he says here, faith in all all your persecution. You see, so persecutions, there, there were numerous incidents of persecution that they were, they were experiencing. And the clause at the end where he says, which you are enduring. And that indicates, see, that the persecution that they're enduring, that it's still going on. It's not something that is ended. Now this probably, at this point, did not involve death or martyrdom. For the Thessalonians, but it took the form of social harassment, discrimination, isolation. And as I, I say, you know, Ray Charles could see that that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. That Christianity is becoming defined as an enemy of the society. You can see it here, you can see it in Canada, you can see it in Australia, you see it in England. This is what's happening. And, you know, you said, ah, you know, no, no, no. Well, I, I think we have to be wise. And we do have to. I, I read an article recently uh, about the situation in Australia where the, the fellow was saying, we really do have to teach people to equip them for what is coming. Because we, those my age grew up where it wasn't a, a, a uh, you know, stigma or something. You didn't get trashed. You didn't lose jobs and this kind of thing. Whereas now that's coming. You just, there was a, a, a law school in Canada that was denied accreditation by, this, by the, you know, the state body because it insisted it was a Christian law school. And it insisted that marriage was between a man and a woman and that sex outside of marriage was sinful. And they denied him accreditation. Now, don't think these kinds of things aren't happening. So as I say, if, 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 but here you see them, they're, they're facing this. This is the kind of thing I think they're facing. So I think we are coming to a place where it will be easier for us to connect to some of the first century context than perhaps it has been in the past. He says in 5 to 10, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also are suffering, since it is a righteous thing in the presence of God to repay affliction to the ones afflicting you and rest to you along with us who are being afflicted. This will happen at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. When he meets out punishment to those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will pay a penalty of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all who have believed and therefore by you. That's an ellipsis that I have supplied for clarity. I think that's implied, that's why I put it in brackets, okay? But he says, and therefore by you, because our testimony to you was believed. Now, their flourishing faith 
and increasing love in the face of persecution, that's a sign of the reality of their faith and thus a marker that in the righteous judgment of God on the final day, they will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which they're suffering, meaning they will enter into the rest of the consummated kingdom of God. That's God's outstanding offer to enter into his rest. You see, that is the picture of the consummated kingdom. Now, the flip side of that righteous judgment is that those unbelievers who are persecuting them for their faith, they will be repaid with affliction, meaning they will be damned. God will vindicate his faithful people. This is not new. This is not unusual. You see, for example, in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. It's nothing new. Now, it, it just it saddens me that large segments of the American church have cast the coming divine judgment as something negative, something that has to be excused or apologized for. But that's a perversion. God's coming judgment is a good thing. It is a thing for which the righteous long. It is a necessary thing. Now, Derek, a, a fellow named Derek Rishmoe, in an article that he just published last month, titled, You Want a God of Judgment. He talks about how he notes in that article how Frederick Douglass, the 19th century abolitionist and former slave, how in his autobiography, Frederick, Frederick Douglass recounts the tragedy of his grandmother's death after a lifetime of bondage and servitude to her master she was, when she was too old to be of use to them. They callously sent her off alone to die alone, apart from her family. And after recounting that, Douglas asked, Will not a righteous God visit for these things? And Rishmi Mawi goes on in that article, and he says, That question continues to echo, though, for more than just the past injustices of American slavery. The crimes and atrocities reported by the 24-hour news cycle, the cycle that threatens to churn up our souls most days, lead me to turn this question over and over in my mind. Every headline I read about yet another sexual abuse victim coming forward, testifying to abuse by a major Hollywood mogul, or worse, by the victim's famous youth pastor and the church who covered it up, will not a righteous God visit for these things. Every victim of political injustice who makes the nightly news both abroad and at home. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? Every report of a child who's been abused and traumatized in an immigration detention center for the last few years, despite the fact most of us are only hearing about it now. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? Every abortion mills, or every day abortion mills are open in America, legally ending the lives of thousands of unborn children. Children never held, never loved, never even given the dignity of a name. Children we never think about because their lives are snuffed out behind closed doors and sterilized rooms with white gloved hands. Children known only to the all-seeing God. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? While the strain of our anger-inducing media culture affects us all, there is at least one small benefit. We're finally in a place 
where we can see the goodness of David's praise, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. We're often told our, our culture doesn't want an angry God of judgment. This age can't abide any more teaching on a God full of wrath who will prepare his weapons for battle with the unrepentant oppressors of God's people. But I don't entirely buy that view. Now when I think of our, not when I think of our rage, he's talking about our culture's rage against injustice. He says, now when I think of our righteous anger at injustice, not when I think of our righteous anger at injustice, in a world crooked and ruined with rebellion, I think deep down we all know we need a God who feels indignation every day. We know it would be a greater tragedy if God never visited for these things. We would be terrified to discover he was an unrighteous judge who never condemned, never punished, never dealt with the crimes of this world, which is no judge at all. And I think that's right. I think that's how we see it. Now, we who are redeemed, what do we do? We celebrate it. What do we pray? Come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. I don't cower about it. So go, oh, no, he's coming in John. Come! Come! Set this world right! All of the brokenness and sickness and sinfulness Come and set it right. N.T. Wright, I've mentioned him many times, well-known theologian. N.T. Wright, he puts it this way in his book, Surprised by Hope. He says, the picture of Jesus as the coming judge is the central feature of another absolutely vital and non-negotiable Christian belief that there will indeed be a judgment in which the Creator God will set the world right once and for all. The word judgment carries negative overtones for a good many people in our liberal and post-liberal world. We need to remind ourselves that throughout the Bible, not least in Psalms, God's coming judgment is a good thing, something to be celebrated, longed for, yearned over. It causes people to shout for joy in the trees of the field to clap their hands. In a world of systematic injustice, bullying, violence, arrogance, and oppression, the thought that there might come a day when the wicked are firmly put in their place and the poor and weak are given their due is the best news there can be. Faced with a world of rebellion, a world full of exploitation and wickedness, a good God must be a God of judgment. You see, that is part of God's character being, and we need to see it that way. We need to recognize that. All right, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10. The judgment, this judgment that he's talking about, this judgment will happen at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven. Jesus is coming back from heaven. You see it in John 14, Acts 1, you see it in many other places. He's coming accompanied by his angels in flaming fire. You see that also in Matthew 24, 29 to 31 and elsewhere. His return is not going to be a secret. Like we used to always joke years ago, like, you know, the idea, yeah, somebody had said, I think, that Jesus was working somewhere over in California. Not going to be like that. You see, it's not going to be like that. When he, when he, returns, when he returns in power and glory, to consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated at his first coming, his true identity will be visually and unmistakably revealed to the world. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will be the Son of Man. So the Son of Man will be in his, in his day. You see that in Luke 17, 24. Now at that time, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see in Philippians 2, 9, 11, it says, Therefore also God highly exalted him and graciously gave to him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, that of the heavenly ones and the earthly ones and the ones under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Now some will do so in joyful spontaneity. That will be us. 
You see, we will, hey, yeah. You see, yeah. Finally. You see, some will do it in joyful spontaneity, but some will do it out of reluctant fear. You see, they will simply have to acknowledge that it's up and I must confess his authority and bow before him. But every knee's bowing. Demons, rebellious, everybody is going to bow at that time. As you see here, Roman, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, which combines Daniel 7, 13 and Zechariah 12, 10, it sums it up this way. It says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. And you say, well, well you know, it, it, why are the tribes wailing? Because the tribes are wailing because those who are not with him are going to face judgment. That's why they're wailing. Because a day is coming. Reckoning is coming. Judgment is coming. And so this is why they will wind up wailing. So, in fact, Paul is already anticipating he's going to address in, in uh, chapter 2 this idea about, well, somebody's saying that he's already come. Well, Paul is saying, look, you know, you understand that couldn't be. Okay, he's already laying that groundwork, which we'll discuss in detail when we get there. Now, at that time, Jesus will mete out punishment to those who do not know God, who are then described in the next clause as those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a conjunction here, you see, and I'm with those who don't think that it's functioning as two separate things, but it is a description. It is ep ex ex Ep-exegetical is the word for how this functions, so you'd understand as that is. You know, those, he says, those who don't know God, that is who don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've captured that by just omitting the conjunction and putting a comma there. It's explanatory. They are two parallel things. It's not one and two. And I'm not alone in thinking that. Bruce thinks that, Wanamaker thinks that, Green thinks that, and that makes the most sense. And that's what he's saying. You see, that if you are not connected to Jesus, that's the key. That's the criterion of judgment. Are you or are you not a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's all that matters. That's the criterion of judgment. Are you connected? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you responded to the gracious offer of God in Jesus Christ? If you had, peace Joy, delight, great. If you have not, punishment. And this is what, this is what he's laying out here. I mean, you see, Jesus couldn't have been more, more direct, right? When he says here in 14.6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What's the criterion of judgment? Well, he is. Are you with him? Are you in him? He says in uh, Peter in Acts 4, 11 and 12, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Apostle John in 1 John 2, 23, Everyone who denies the Son also does not have the Father. Right? And you see a lot of this. Well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not into Jesus or whatever, but I'm kind of tuned into this spiritual kind of stuff. Anyone who denies the Son, and you say, well, I don't believe the Bible. That's a different story. That's a different discussion. In the body of Christ, we who understand what the Bible is as the Word of God, what does the Word of God say? It says that Jesus is the way. He's the exclusive way. It says everyone who denies the Son also does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Green says, Gene Green in his commentary, he says, the New Testament frequently describes the act of conversion as obedience to the gospel. Such a description of the event cues us to the fact the gospel is both the promise and offer of salvation and the demand of obedience to its call. You see, God offers at a tremendous price. And he says, here it is. Will you come and accept that? Will you say, okay, or will you continue to hold it off? 
That's, that's the critical thing, you see. It calls humans to respond to the good news of God. But if the divine initiative is rejected, the very same gospel becomes the criteria by which God will judge the person. God calls humans through his gospel, and those who do not respond can only hope for judgment. I mean, this, isn't, this is clear. It's everywhere. That apart from your response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no hope of avoiding judgment. Okay, that's an important message. I feel an obligation to say that. As I've said before, if somebody's riding their bicycle down a road and I know the bridge is out and if I don't tell them they're going to go off, I feel a responsibility. I've got to say, hey, you're heading in a direction you're not going to like. And that's how I see this. He says, no, so not, he says, in the divine scheme, disobedience to the, go- to the gospel is elevated to the status of a criminal offense, a thought uh, quite different from the modern notion that the gospel should be received simply for personal benefit. So this idea, I think, you know, it, it's here where you see that you have this division, Christian and the rest. And you say, well, why is that? Is that because we're so wonderful? Do I even have to say that? Right? I mean, do I have to say that? That that is because of the atoning work of Jesus? That you and I are sinful, but God loves us so much that he sent his son, and we simply just accepted the grace that he's given us. And that's important. Now, the punishment's here described as eternal destruction that you see there in verse 9, which means eternal damage or eternal ruin. It doesn't mean, mean cessation of existence. I understand there are some people that think that. You know, you've had kind of a, a, I don't know if, I wouldn't say resurgence, but you've had from the 20th century up into the 21st century a number of evangelicals who've who've put forth the case that really uh, what's going to happen is after a certain time of judgment that you're simply going to go out of existence. And they read that into these words like destruction. I have a paper on this if this particular subject interests you. And it's called, Does Scripture Teach the Annihilation of the Unsaved? It's much longer than I can talk about now. But uh, at least let me talk about this little verse here, which factors into it. It's evident, see, this idea that it, it means eternal damage or ruin rather than cessation of existence is evident from, the, evident from the fact that Paul, he, as Douglas Moo says, he elaborates the meaning of eternal destruction with the idea of being separated from the presence of God. You see, that's how he's defining it, separated from the presence of God. Michael Holmes says in his commentary, the second part of this sentence defines what he means by the first part. Everlasting destruction, that is, separation from the Lord's presence. For this phrase, Isaiah 2, 10, 19, 21, a judgment passage, and glory. In other words, Paul's definition of, quote, destruction here is precisely the opposite of his definition elsewhere of salvation as being with the Lord always and sharing in God's glory. Now the fact eternal destruction, the fact that it's described as eternal deprivation of the Lord's favoring presence, eternal deprivation of the Lord's favoring presence, that implies the eternal existence of those who are so deprived. As Moo says, Douglas Moo says, it makes little sense to describe people who've been annihilated as being separate from the presence of God. You're not there to experience anything. You're, you don't exist. There's not lack of fellowship. There's nothing. And I think that's the right understanding. Scott McKnight, He says, eternal separation from God is the essence of God's punishment on the wicked. And that's really true. That being away and separated from God, that's the essence of it. He says, as eternal fellowship with God is the essence of God's final deliverance of the faithful. So I'm always talking about the eternal state. And what is it? It's that perfect reality where there's complete love and fellowship with God and one another. That's it. Love of one another completely No ulterior motives, no suspicion, none of that stuff. Nobody playing me, nobody doing this, and complete fellowship with God forever. So this, so he, McKnight says, but separation from God's presence must 
must be defined as non-fellowship, not annihilation. In other words, it could be argued that since God is omnipresent, then banishment from his presence means extinction. It's more likely, however, Paul has in mind an irreversible verdict of non-fellowship with God. A person exists but remains excluded from God's good presence. As I say, I spend, I don't know how, I don't remember how long that paper is, but it's out there and I go in more detail uh, discussing it. Now, elsewhere, this punishment that he talks about, you know this, elsewhere it's described as what? Being thrown into a fiery furnace. Matthew 13, 50, being thrown into a lake of fire. Revelation 14, 9 through 11, Revelation 20, 15, and being thrown into the darkness. That's in Matthew 25, 28 to 30. And the description is often accompanied by this phrase, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So whatever the particulars are, whatever is being said to us through the imagery that can't get any starker, being thrown into a lake of fire, being cast into the darkness, whatever is being said in that imagery, you cannot escape the fact it is the ultimate bummer. It is the ultimate. You can't miss that. Don't in a squabble about, well, what exactly do you think is the fire literal? Is it really? Whatever, don't miss the fact that it is the last place you ever want to be. Now that's revealed by God. And we need to know that. Because that day is coming as sure as I'm standing here. It's as bad as it gets. And at that time, he says that Jesus will be glorified in his saints. He'll be glorified in his saints in the sense that sinful men and women, that's us. He'll be glorified in that sinful men and women will be presented redeemed and glorified through his sacrifice on the cross. Who are these people? Well, they're those who've come through the blood. They are those who have been healed and made righteous by the sacrifice of the perfect one. Well, you see how that glorifies him. We are the fruit of his work. Not our own work. We are the fruit of of his work on that day when we are received in glory he will be glorified because we those sinners are received on the basis of his work you see and so he'll be glorified in us because of his sacrifice on the cross he'll be glorified in us because we will be glorified with him we'll be glorified with him he also will be marveled at by all those who have believed, and I take the preposition there as by, which you can as you see in New Jerusalem Bible and in the, in the uh, uh, CSB, uh, Christian Standard Bible. It'll include, it'll include the Thessalonians. You see, as I said, there, there's an ellipsis here that I, I fill in because he says, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all who have believed, and the Thessalonians have. You see, by all who have believed, and therefore by you, you're going to be marveled at by all who have believed, you have believed, see, because our testimony to you was believed. So I think that's, that's implied there in what he's saying. But you see the idea. What is the, what is the key? Who is glorified? Jesus is glorified. And there's a sense in which that even we are glorified. And he says here in 11 and 12, he says, To this end we also pray concerning you, that our God may count you worthy of the calling and may powerfully fulfill every desire of goodness and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in view of the Thessalonians' conversion, their having believed the missionary's testimony and in view of the greatness of Christ's work, to which their conversion unites them, work that will culminate on that day with his being glorified in them and being marveled at by them. The missionaries are praying regularly for God to work powerfully that the Thessalonians might live worthily of the gospel that they received. 
They are praying that God will bring to completion in the Thessalonians every desire motivated by goodness and every work that is spurred by faith. In other words, they're praying for God to continue transforming the Thessalonians' lives so that the Lord Jesus, the one who achieved their salvation, the one who purchased their salvation will be glorified in them now as well as in the future. You see, living as a committed disciple, especially in times of persecution, in times when it costs you to live that way. I heard that. Let me just finish this. See, living that way, it glorifies him in that it says to a world he's worthy of that allegiance. He's worthy of that submission. He's worthy of that imitation. Whatever it costs me, he's worthy of that. You see, and that's what, he, that's what he's praying for them here. I heard that bell. It comes sometimes at more inopportune times than others, but there you have it. Thanks for coming.